I had to read again from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, which I am absolutely sure that you have memorized by now. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. <clears throat> Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may, may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. Verse 14, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Yeah. Now we're going to get to the praying part in the last message in this series, which is just a couple of weeks away. But we have to keep on praying for all the saints because all the saints need our prayers. Aren't you glad that somebody's praying for you? Amen. Anybody here need prayer? Amen. Aren't you glad that somebody is praying for you every single day? Yes. If you're in this church, I can promise you, there's at least one or two people, I know I am, there's somebody calling your name out in prayer every single day. And I trust that you're doing the same thing. That you have a prayer list, at least your, your close family and, and your pastor. There are certain people that you should be praying for, calling those names out in prayer every day. And I'm sure that you are. I trust that you're doing that. And not just for people that you know. The Bible says here to pray for all of the saints. All Christians. That, that's about a billion people. So I doubt you prayed for a billion people today. But, but God knows in general you need to be praying for the church. For all the saints. For instance, when's the last time you prayed for the Christians in Ukraine? That, that country that's under attack right now. Christians that are being persecuted. They're being attacked by an ungodly nation. I'm not saying Ukraine's the best nation in the world. But they're being attacked by a very ungodly nation. Where Christians have been persecuted. Where churches have been persecuted for generations now. The Christians and the churches in Russia. Pray for the Ukraine. Pray for the Christians in Russia. Pray for that underground church that's thriving in Russia. The underground church that's thriving in China. Pray for the saints. Amen. Even the ones you don't know. Amen. But if you're not praying for the ones you do know, chances are pretty good you're not praying for the, for, the church, for the saints that you don't know. So I hope you're praying for the ones you do know, like John, John Vogler. I hope that those of you who know John have called him or text him and just let him know that you're praying for him. And I can tell you this, no one is more appreciative of your prayer than John is. He needs your prayer, and if you let him know that you're praying for him, Oh, thank you so much. He is so appreciative. I hope you're praying for Lynn. Lynn has been through so much these last few weeks. And God, help her today. Help her touch her and, and make her win. I'm sure that we're praying for our church, for our people. But here, here's something that really tugs on my heart. I'm pretty sure that there are people that I'm praying for today. I pray for people. That I'm pretty sure no one on earth prayed for that person today except me. I know some people. That I prayed for. I'm not sure that anybody on earth prayed for that person today. If I wouldn't have called that person's name out in prayer, there's a good chance nobody would have mm -hmm. on earth. Now, we all know that Jesus is praying for us, mm -hmm. ever making intercession to the Father for us. He's always praying for us. So if anybody wants to be like Jesus, pray for people. Mm -hmm. But of course, the problem there is that you have to actually think about other people in order to pray for other people. Mm -hmm. And that is just not natural to our selfish human nature. Selfish humans. That flesh. The flesh part of you that is never going to be saved. That's why you have to crucify it every day. To overcome it. Take up your cross daily, Jesus said, and follow me. So you have to crucify that selfish nature. You're going to struggle with it your whole life. But it is selfish. It makes you want to think only about you. And if you do think about other people, a lot of times you only think, in the flesh, you only think of them in terms of what they can do for you. So if you're friends with John Vogler, if you know John Vogler, who's one of our deacons, who's not able to be with us because he's about to have hip surgery in about a month, he can't move. Moving hurts. He's shut in. He can't get around right now. But if, if, if you know John, but he's not important to you. 
If you know him, but he's not important to what your life is focused on, you're probably not thinking about John and not praying for John. And that's exactly what Satan wants. Satan hates prayer. And Satan hates John Vogler. Because anybody that knows John, that deep voice guy that sits right there, anybody that knows John knows that John prays. So Satan doesn't want you to be like John. And Satan doesn't want you to be like Jesus. And so his battle plan... Satan's battle plan is to distract you. He's, his battle plan against you and against this church is to fill your mind up with you. Your situation, your problems, your concerns, your dreams, your hope, just you, all about you, so you don't think about anybody else. That's what he wants. He's battling against you for that purpose, and the battlefield is your mind. It's the battle for your mind. It's right here, right between your ears. The battle for your mind, which you have to do everything you can possibly do to protect. Protect this ground. So when you armor up every day, don't forget the helmet. Amen. Protect your mind. Amen. Protect your brains. <laughs> because that's where you make your choices. Including the most important choice of all, which is salvation. And that's the title of this morning's message. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. So thank you for your word. Flow through me as I preach your word. And touch every one of us here, Lord God, because there's something in this message that each one of us needs. Help us, Lord God, to be alert, to hear it, receive it, and respond to it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul calls it the helmet of salvation. But he stole that. Paul didn't come up with that thought. And obviously he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. But he's actually quoting Isaiah. Isaiah said this hundreds of years earlier in Isaiah chapter 59 and verse number 17 in a prophecy about Christ. Isaiah says, he put on righteousness as a breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. So way before Paul said this, God knew the importance of your brain. The human brain may be the most complex thing in all of God's physical creation. There is nothing more complex in the entire physical universe than your brain. And yes, I mean your brain. <laughs> Scientists tell us that we only use a portion, just a small fraction of our brains. And we probably all know that some of us use more than others. But we're only all using a fraction of the capacity. And whatever you're using, hey, use it. Use what you got. But see, some people think that church is where they tell you to check your brain at the door. Like you don't need to think when you come in here. We'll tell you what to think. We'll tell you how to feel. We'll tell you what you're supposed to do. You just check your brain at the door. That you can't have brains and faith and you don't really need brains and faith all you have to do is just just have faith but listen you can and you do you can have both faith and brains and there are some churches that don't really promote that there are some churches that want their people to remain ignorant of god's word that way they can just tell them whatever they want to and the people just follow along blindly. And that's what some churches want. But that's not God. God's the one who says, come now and let us reason together. Amen. That means think. God gave us brains and he wants us to use those brains. He wants us to use our brains to seek and find the God who gave us those brains. So that we can find out who he is, what he wants us to do, and what he wants us to be. Listen, if God <clears throat> didn't want you to use your brain, why did he write a book? You know you need brains to read, right? Why, why did he write a book if he didn't want you to use your brain? So God knows the importance of your brain, and God knows the importance of protecting your brain. And it is very important when you are at war... That you know the importance of this. That you remember this. When you are at war, don't lose your head. If you're going to lose anything, don't lose your head. Paul says to Timothy in, first, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 5, Keep your head in every situation. Now, of course, what he means there is to be cool and calm and collected and not to you know, blow up and not to lose your head in that respect. But when you're at war, when you're actually fighting and you're in physical war, you can lose your head. And there are a lot of body parts that you can live without. This isn't one of them. 
I just read on the internet, I saw on the internet that Deion Sanders, who's a famous football player and athlete, actually played for the Atlanta Falcons football team and the Atlanta Braves baseball team at the same time for a little while. Great athlete. But I saw on the internet, amputee, he, he had some amputation, and I said, oh no, what happened to Deion Sanders? And so I looked it up, and it turns out he had blood clots. His life was actually in danger. And they thought they were going to have to remove at least a portion of his leg, and it turns out they only had to remove two of his toes, which is not great. I mean, the blood clots are serious business, but you can live without those two toes. You can't live without your head. Keep, you're going to fight. Keep your head. So God gives us a helmet, but helmets are not the first line of defense. In fact, helmets are the last line of defense. So you wouldn't go to war thinking, hey, if you're going to hit me, hit me in the head because I've got a really great helmet on. You, don't, you wouldn't say that. You don't lead with your head when you're fighting. You don't lead with a helmet. That's not. You wouldn't go to war and say, hey, everybody hit me in the head. You're going to get injured. And almost all head injuries are serious. And even if it doesn't penetrate, penetrate that helmet, it can still hurt you. It can rattle you and make it hard for you to think. That's why they have that targeting rule in, the, in college football because they don't want these kids to go in with the crown of their head because that's where neck injuries come from so often. It's not just about the person you're hitting. It's about the person doing the hitting. Don't lead with your head because you're probably going to injure yourself. Don't lead with your helmet. If you want to fight with your head in battle, don't use your head for battle. Anybody watch wrestling? <laughs> you want to talk about, I'm not talking about wrestling. I'm talking about wrestling. You know they do those headbutts? Fake. <laughs> That's not real. They do it like that. Because if they did that, they'd both fall out. <laughs> don't, don't, lose, don't use your head like that. Your helmet is your last line of defense. So I want to show you some other ways that you can defend yourself and still keep your head. The helmet is for defense, but it's not your only defensive measure. So I'm going to talk about some other ways to protect yourself using your head, but not necessarily your helmet. To defend yourself. And one of the best things, one of, the, one of a soldier's best uh, pro, uh, opportunities for defense is take cover. Mm -hmm. Cover is different than concealment. Mm -hmm. Concealment is where you try to hide so they don't see you. Cover is where they can't actually hurt you. Mm -hmm. Like if they're sending bombs in, find something that you can get under or that you can get behind that the enemy can't blow up. Find shelter whenever you can. Psalm 91 and verse number 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Sometimes, even if you're a strong soldier, you need to hide. Yes. Hide yourself away. Sometimes it's not time to attack. Sometimes you've got to hide. Sometimes what God's mission for you is just survive. You're going to go through some tough times where the best thing you can do is survive. Find cover. But another great line of defense is numbers. We don't have to be alone. Don't be alone. There really is strength in numbers. I always call it teams. Ecclesiastes 4 verses 9 through 12 says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up, but pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Then it says, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. God always works through teams. But having said that, sometimes you're going to be alone. And God's going to allow it. Sometimes. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He went there to pray with his disciples, and then they come to arrest him. And first, impetuous Peter pulls out that sword and cuts that servant's ear off. Jesus heals him, but he says, take me and let these men go. And so they arrest Jesus. And when they arrested him, what did everybody else do? They ran for him. Sure. Remember in the book of Mark, uh, uh, Mark is, is probably writing this. And he was probably a young man at that time, and he's there. And he says there's this young man that ran away, and they grabbed his clothes, and he ran off naked. Because he ran away. They, they abandoned Jesus. At least during that time, they abandoned Jesus in that garden. Paul says that my first defense, probably his first trial in Rome, although we're not real sure, but at his first defense, he says, I was all alone. Mm -hmm. Nobody stood with me. Remember Joseph in the Old Testament who was just a teenager when his brother sold him off into slavery? And he was just a young guy who was by himself. Sometimes we're going to be alone. You can't avoid that all the time. But I'm saying when you can't avoid it, 
Avoid it. Don't be alone when you don't have to be. Predators look for strays and stragglers. Amen. Find strength in numbers. And then another good line of defense is a good offense. You probably heard the saying, especially in football, that, that the best offense is a good defense. And then those dogs prove it this year. It's okay. You can say go dogs if you want to. All right, I'll say it. Go dogs. <laughs> oh, John, I miss you, brother. Go dogs. <laughs> Good defense. But sometimes the best defense is also a good offense. Don't wait for Satan to shoot first. When you can identify him, you know you're going into battle. If you can shoot first, shoot first. Identify and attack. Now, I say identify because make sure you're attacking the right person. We struggle not against flesh and blood. But when you see an opportunity to attack the enemy, don't wait for him to shoot first. You shoot first anytime and every time you can because we have some powerful weapons. Yes. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Amen. And I just love the way the King James Version says it there. It says, the weapons that we fight with are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We have some powerful weapons. I'll talk about one next week, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We'll talk about that next week. But God wants us sometimes to attack. And if you attack first, put them on the defense. That's a pretty good defense when you don't have to stand your ground. You're taking somebody else's ground. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to get there first and shoot first. One of my battalion commanders said it like this. Get there firstest with the mostest. <laughs> Because we get there first, we already have the most. The weapons we fight with are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. But you're not always able to do that. Sometimes you're already under attack. And here's a great suggestion for, uh, for a line of defense. When arrows are coming at you, you're here and arrows are being shot here. Move. <laughs> get out of the way. Move out of the way of those arrows. Shoot, move, and communicate. That's tactic. Shoot, move. It's harder to hit a moving target. Any hunters know that? It's harder to hit a moving target. And so don't just stay with Stand your ground does not mean that you always have to die in place. Right. Almost all good defensive positions have fallback positions. Mm -hmm. We dig in here. The avenue of approach where the enemy is probably coming is right in front of us. And so we dig in here. But here's a good place to hit him first. But if he gets past, past that place, I've got a better place that I can fall back to to hit him for the next attack. So there's almost always movement, even in defense. If you can get out of the way, get out of the way. You see something deadly coming, move. Anybody ever play dodgeball when you were a kid? You know, some good lessons in some of those games we played as kids that follow us into adulthood. <laughs> When deadly stuff is coming at you, dodge it. If you can get out of the way, get out of the way. And maybe there's a person in your life that you need to move away from. A place, a situation, a television show. Maybe there's something that you need to move away from. Maybe there's a person in your life that you need to get closer to. A good influence. Maybe there's a place, a show, something, music that you can get closer to, but you got to move. you got to change from where you are to where you need to be. Sometimes you've got to move. Mm -hmm. If you're under a heavy attack and it's just too heavy, if you're being tempted and the temptation is too great, move. In fact, the Bible says sometimes run. Mm -hmm. Like in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, the Bible says flee sexual immorality. And that is so important. God says when you come under that attack, run for it. Get away from that. It's not cowardly. It's just smart to run away from stuff that you know you can't handle. Amen. And so in the words of uh, the late, great Kenny Rogers, you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. And the Bible says that more than once. Sometimes you just need to get out of that as quickly as Somebody, you need to get out of that as quickly as God will give you the feet to run. Amen. Get away. Amen. Sometimes the best thing you can do is move out of the way. Yeah. And then, of course, our most effective defense is our shield. 
Ephesians 6, 16 calls it the shield of faith with which we can quench every one of Satan's fiery darts. We can extinguish every single one of those flaming arrows of the enemy, that shield of faith. But it's not our only defense. You think if this one's so great, why do I need anything else? And here's why. Because it's the shield of faith. And sometimes we have it. Sometimes we don't. It's our greatest defense when we have it. When we have faith. But sometimes we just don't. It's not your salvation. Listen, your faith is not, your, your salvation is not in your faith. Your salvation is in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. By grace through faith are you saved? Mm -hmm. But if, if you just someday you just don't have it, like the disciples, oh, you have little faith, which means most of the time you didn't have any faith. Sometimes we lose it. It doesn't take your salvation away, but you just had a rough day. Or maybe you didn't read the Bible like you should have. Faith mm -hmm. comes by hearing the word of God. And sometimes your faith is great, and sometimes your faith is gone. And so if you don't have, aren't you glad it's not your only defense? Sometimes you lose it. Here's what I'm telling you. Don't ever go into any battle overconfident. Preacher preached this yesterday, uh, uh, Tom. Don't go to any battle overconfident. Right. Don't put any confidence in your flesh or your abilities. Remember Samson? I preached about Samson not too long ago. I'll just get up and shake myself and go out and beat him again. And he forgot his strength isn't in himself. His strength is in God. And he had lost it. And sometimes we're strong as Christians. And sometimes we're weak. So don't be overconfident because a smart enemy uses his opponent's overconfidence. Boy, the Japanese did that because in World War II, we thought we could beat those Asians. And they proved that they were a whole lot tougher than we gave them credit for. Don't be overconfident when you go into battle. We can defeat everything with that shield of faith when we have it. But what if Satan gets past that? What if there's a crack in that armor and the only thing left is your headgear? If you haven't read your bulletin, I think I put a pretty good article in there this week about headgear. <laughs> anyway, read your bulletin. So the, the headgear, which is, of course, the helmet. That last line of defense is the helmet. Because your faith may waver. You may not move quickly enough. You may not get off the first shot. Sometimes you're going to be alone. And God will not always keep you undercover. Sometimes he'll allow you to be tested. Sometimes he'll allow you to be exposed. But in all of those other situations, here's what you can rely on. That helmet, you can rely on this. You are still saved. Yes. You are a Christian. You are secure. If you're right with God, you are secure. Even if your armor cracks, you've got that helmet of salvation. Mm -hmm. You are safe. So don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Just be careful. Yes. And put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God. And you don't have to be afraid. Mm -hmm. And so every day we put on the full armor of God. And every day... I put on the helmet of salvation, and I've shown you how I do that, but I actually go through the motions. You don't have to do that. And I don't just mean go through the motions like routinely. I mean, I really seriously want to put on that helmet of salvation every day, and I do it like this. I say, oh, God, protect our minds and our thoughts. This is in your notes, and you'll see it on the screen. Oh, God, protect our minds and our thoughts, judgments, understandings, and attitudes so that we will know you and have our confidence and our hope in you today. Amen. And all of that stuff comes between your ears. Yes. God, protect our minds because that's the battlefield. Yes. God, protect our thoughts because whoever controls your thoughts controls you. Yes. God, I pray for good judgment so that I'll make right decisions. God, I pray for understanding so that I will see clearly the difference between what is right and what is wrong. And God, I pray for a good attitude. I pray this a lot. God, I pray for a good attitude because, you know, you can do the right thing the wrong way and be in just as much trouble. And so maybe better than anything else, your attitude can help you determine who's winning the battle for your mind.
God, protect our attitudes. And I say, I pray that I will know you, that I may know you. And church, there's only one way to know God. And it's in his word. Amen. You've got to get into the word of God to read the Bible. You haven't read it enough. You don't know it well enough. You've got to read the word to know God. I pray that we will know you and have our confidence and our hope in you today. Amen. Not in me, not in, my, not in my experience, not in how long I've been saved, not in how faithful I am to my church, not in any of my thoughts or anything that I can do for myself. God, my hope is in you. My hope is in you, Lord. Amen. And my confidence is always in you. Amen. Now, I don't expect you to write all this down. I don't expect anybody to pray like I pray. You don't have to pray like I pray. But I bet you there are things in this prayer that you need to add to your daily prayer life. Because mm -hmm. it's important. Who is winning the battle for your mind? Mm -hmm. And have you been taking some really bad headshots lately? Mm -hmm. If you've taken headshots, they've gotten through everything else. Mm -hmm. Your mind. Have you, and, and we all experience this. Have you been taking some really bad headshots lately? If so, thank God for that helmet. Amen. If he's still attacking like that, you ain't gone down yet. You are saved. You're still here. You haven't turned your back on God. But you need to stop taking so many headshots. And so maybe you need to sharpen up on some of those other defensive skills. Somebody needs to find some shelter. Mm -hmm. Thus saith the Lord, take cover. <laughs> you are too exposed. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to find help. Mm -hmm. Find a partner. Find a teammate. Find a team. Somebody to God. So, God says to somebody, you are too alone. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to stand up and fight. Don't just keep taking shots. Fight. Be aggressive. Use the weapons that God has given you and hit back. Just make sure you hit the right person. <laughs> make sure it's the devil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but strike back. Don't just keep taking those shots. Go on the offense. Somebody needs to move. In fact, God says somebody needs to run. You need to be able to live to fight another day. You are in trouble. You are in over your head. God says to somebody, pull back. It's not cowardly. It's just good sense. Every army has to do that. Sometimes in almost every battle is a point where you just have to pull back, regroup, reorganize. Somebody needs rest. Pull back. Then somebody, you're just not reading the Bible. You're not in the Word of God. Every day you need faith. If you need faith, you need the Word. When do you need faith? Like constantly? Sharpen that shield. Get that shield up. Get into the Word of God. That's where faith comes from. Where's your faith? Where's your shield? And then because all of us at some point are going to take those headshots. At some point, all of us are going to, are going to have, not have the faith that we need. At some point, we're going, to, we're going to lack in almost all those other areas. Thank God for that helmet. By faith, you are saved. By grace through faith. And so here's what God says to everybody. If you're a Christian... Peace, peace, relax, peace, that helmet. Yeah. Mm. Praise God, yeah. that helmet. Mm -hmm. Protect my mind, oh God. Protect my thoughts, oh God. Keep your head in all situations. Remember, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that's provided mm -hmm. that for you. Mm -hmm. And that never fails. Amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Yeah. And thank you, Lord, for the full armor of God, including that helmet of salvation. Thank you, Lord, that we can be protected and we know we're safe and secure in your hands because we have that helmet. Thank you for the full armor. Thank you for that helmet today. And help us, Lord God, to know peace. Help us, Lord God, to know peace that comes from being a child of the King. And we thank you and give you praise for it in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Amen. Amen.